no April birthdays. Okay, anyone celebrating an anniversary this week? Oh, Heath and Heather. 25. Oh, 25 years for Heath and Heather Pulso. Dax has a birthday today, too. He's 24. We haven't seen him for so long, we forget who he is. <clears throat> okay, we got announcements. There's, there's the man. Yeah, just a couple of announcements. First of all, we're in the process of uh, updating our prayer chain. Uh, Donna's been running that for us for quite a while, but... But as many of you know, they're going to be moving on from us here. So if you would like to be added to the prayer chain, there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. The one out there has almost filled up. So I'll, if, if uh, it runs out of spaces, just let me know and I'll print out another copy of that so that you guys see that. But this would be if you want to be sent prayer needs. There's also a checkbox if you want to be called texted or emailed, whatever is most convenient for you. Uh, for the time being, Heather Helsel and I are going to team up on that. Uh, the reason being, as I said last week, she is the principal of the high school, as many of you know, so she can't always check her phone all the time. So if you have an email, if you want to send a prayer need by email, email it to her. Otherwise, if you need to call or text about it, you can call or text me and my phone number is there on screen. Please don't prank call me because I answer every call. So please don't prank call me, but feel free to send any needs to me anytime, day or night on that as well. And we will get that sent out. Um, if you are already part of the prayer chain, one last thing to say on that, you do not need to re-sign up. But if you would like to update your contact information or maybe update the way you're getting it, maybe you're getting called and you prefer to get texted or vice versa or whatever it might be, feel free to re-sign up and we'll update all of that. Our other announcement that I have for you this morning is about our adult Bible study, which is starting back up April 14th, which is a week from this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Usually it's going to be in the fellowship hall, but we will be in the sanctuary this first Wednesday, so not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. We will start out in the sanctuary because our South Callaway girls basketball team is going to be having their banquet over there on that night. So uh, we will be here in the sanctuary the first week in the fellowship hall the weeks following that. And I highly recommend uh, you to uh, participate in this because it's over the first six chapters of Daniel about living for God in a world that does not live for God, living for God in a pagan world. Uh, the one other one I know of, which Marley, you might want to announce one because it's more fun, for our kids. Are there any kids here? Okay, if you are a kid, after service today, so there won't be children's church during service, but after service, we have a little goodie bag for you. So make sure you do not rush out of church too quickly after the service so you can get your goodie bag. And yes, Dave, I guess you can have one. That's fine. That's not young at heart, Dave. That's young. <laughs> I think you misinterpreted that. <laughs> okay, Joyce has an announcement. So if you didn't hear that, Helen Ely's having a birthday on Friday. Gail said she'd be 95, so if you remember that, send her a card. Um, she gets her mail there at Presbyterian, doesn't she? So that's where she's at. Okay, the only other thing I want to say is thank everybody for participate that participated in the 40 hours of prayer. We had all of our slots filled up, and um, that was our ongoing thing for the church, and it's been going for many years. I thank everybody for um, doing that, and I hope everybody was blessed by it, and uh, we'll wait till next year, and we'll fill it up again. Okay, I think Mrs. Smart has her candle lighters ready.
Let's try this out. He is risen. Hey, good job. All right. Uh, so as we go into our theme time, for those of you who, who perhaps don't attend on a weekly basis, uh, one thing that I've really been trying to do recently is develop our identity of who we are as a church. And I boiled it down to three basic ingredients. We are Bible-based, we are discipleship-driven, and we are mission-minded. And so each week, I've been going over one of these categories, each month one category, each week a different aspect of that. And we have circled back around to being Bible-based. And so a theme verse for this morning is found in Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Church, we are a Bible-based church because the Bible can just so intricately tell you what is going on in your heart. The Bible can so intricately tell you what is going on in your mind and in your spirit. The Word of God actively reveals truth that applies to us at our deepest level. I could come up here and just tell you my opinions. You could have someone else, you know, anyone else come up and tell you their opinions, but the Word of God is unique in how it is able to tell you even things that go between thoughts. You know, why do I want to do this? Why do I not want to do this? The Bible will go even into those depths and help you understand what's going on inside of you because that's, that's the author of all creation's owner's manual for it. So he created you, he understands you well, and the word of God is what shows you who he is and shows you who you are. As we enter into our time of prayer, does anyone have anything they want to praise God for? God is good. Amen. Yes. Beautiful weather. Yes. <laughs> I'm not always glad I live in Missouri because sometimes the season change every week. But yeah, I agree. Speaking of the seasoning, thank you guys so much who brought breakfast food in this morning. Uh, it was all really wonderful too. So thank you guys for that. Anyone else? No one else? Out of this entire group of people, no one else has anything they want to praise God for? Yeah. Hey, we are back in the building. Uh, this is actually my first Easter service as your pastor in the building. Last year when we were doing this, we had to meet a far way away. And so it's just not the same, is it? So I'm very thankful that we're able to be here and we're able to fellowship with one another. Anyone else? All right, how about any prayer? Oh, yes. Wow, awesome. Praise God. Austin, I'm going to tell you a little trick, all right? You can, you can write this down if you want. Here's a little trick. Next year, ask people at the church on Sundays, all right? Just, just save that one for later. Amen? Okay, cool. All right, anyone else have any praises they want to share? All right, how about any prayer requests? Sure, absolutely. There are a lot of ongoing prayer needs in our church as well that, that many of you know about. Please, uh, one thing I did, so many people came in to pray in the office and... I made a little board there for people to write down things to pray for and just the the things that people wrote down I'll probably take a picture of it and put it on our social media uh, in this next week But there are many families who are mourning the loss of loved ones We have many people who are still struggling with sickness and can't be here as a result of that and uh, Yeah, keep all of them in your prayers keep our community in your prayers and this church in your prayers and uh, Let's go ahead and bow our heads together. Oh, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyone else? Make sure everybody has a chance here. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Yes. 
Oh yeah, old Stetson hurt his foot. So yeah, prayers that he gets out of that boot quickly. Right. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you first and foremost because he that because your son is indeed risen, O oh God, that he is the conqueror of death and he is the conqueror of sin that he loved us enough to go to the cross to pay for our sins, and I cannot praise you enough for that. Dear God, I praise you for the day-to-day -day blessings that you give us as well, though. I praise you for the good weather. I praise you for just this wonderful crowd of people, for the good food we've gotten to eat, uh, just for the, the good time of fellowship that we're about to have and, and the time of praise and hearing from your word. Dear God, we have many who are still in need. Dear God, from people who have lost loved ones, to people who are sick and afflicted uh, and, and are unable to come and join us in, in our company here. Dear God, I ask that you comfort those in mourning and that you strengthen those who are weak, oh God, that you heal those who are sick. Uh, dear God, I ask that you be with uh, the needs that were mentioned and the needs that were not mentioned, oh God, for I, I undoubtedly know that there are many needs that some just go beyond words that we can't even express. Uh, what we need. So, dear God, I ask that you show up and meet the needs that we don't even realize that we have. For, dear God, you are good enough to do that, and you constantly surprise us, and I, I can't praise you enough for that either. Dear God, I ask that you bless the service this morning, that all that we say and do might be done in a way that's pleasing to you, and that you might reveal yourself to us uh, as, as you always find a way to do, oh God. Please transform us by renewing our minds that we might be more like Jesus and that others might see our good works and glorify you. I ask in the great name of Jesus, amen. What would I do without you, Marla? <laughs> anyway, I want, I want to start this morning with the word, the first words Jesus said to his disciples after he rose from the dead. Peace be with you, each and every one of you. And the peace that we get from him and from the Holy Spirit is what the Bible calls an everlasting peace. And it's a peace that passes understanding. We can't even understand it. But it's such a wonderful gift from our Father. Um, Sally is supposed to leave today, and she hurt herself. Is it the bad knee or the good knee? That's <laughs> Both. So she asked me to leave for her, and then Donna called me and said, this is her last Sunday, her and Dwayne, with us, and it, could she join me? And I said, well, do you want to leave? She said, I can't leave by myself. So we're, we're a team today. We are a team. <laughs> and uh, scripture is from John 20, verse 31. And this is after uh, Jesus is risen, and uh, Jesus did many other mir miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you have life in his name. So by believing in Jesus, it's not just what we're doing here and now, but someday, someday. All right, and when you stand to sing this morning, I'm asking that you just don't pretend like it, don't sing for the person next to you. Don't you're sit, this is, you are praising our wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes. So sing from your heart. <laughs>
is in our old book and we were back in the old building. So if you know it, sing loud. Father God, we thank you once again for this day that you've given us. And we're rejoicing, not just because it is so, so beautiful outside and you've given us this wonderful day, but we're really rejoicing because you gave us Jesus. Where would we be without him? And we just are thankful for uh, the tithes and offerings that are given to this church family. And we just pray, as always, that you use them to further your kingdom. I ask that you bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Wayne's going to come up and uh, it's not a studio. <laughs> and I'm only staying here because they asked me to. They do need a towel. downside. I know it is. <laughs> so it's always open. And we will pray for you all continuously. And keep us in your prayer. We will be back. We'll be visiting with my brothers in Columbia still. So we'll be back seeing you. But we just want to tell you all goodbye. And then we love you.
pray for them. Dear God, I ask that you be with this faithful brother and sister as they go, as they leave our company physically, but never in heart, never spiritually, oh God. Dear God, they'll be part of this body until we reunite once again in eternity, and we praise you for that. But dear God, I ask that you take this wonderful couple and that you give them a good fellowship to go to where they're moving. Dear God, that you, you help them to be the blessings there that they have been here, that you keep them safe, Lord, that you help them adjust to this new area, oh God, and to just grow in faith in you throughout all of this, oh God. And as I said, please just continue our relationship with them, even though they'll be gone in, in presence physically. Let us always keep them in our memory as well. I ask this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And I will tell you that God has directed every single step of this Amen. journey Amen. in such an awesome way. And as Pastor Cody said this morning, why are we always surprised when he does this? But it has fell from A to Z in steps that are absolutely unbelievable. Even the neighbors coming and greeting us the day we pull in the driveway. It's amazing. Thank you, God. We love you all. All right. Uh, I've got a few things to say by way of introduction. Uh, first of all, I got us out of sunrise service about 30 minutes early, so I have banked that time to be able to use this service. I think that's how that works. Um, also, I, I cannot make a promise, but I will ha make every effort to get you out of here by noon, which is good considering we're starting an hour early. So uh, I don't want to make too many uh, bad presuppositions this morning. Easter is always a unique Sunday at any church. We have a number of faces that we don't always see, and this is a great blessing. We have some people who I'm sure are visiting from out of town who are visiting family, but I, I have no doubt we also have people who church might not be your thing. And, and I'm here to tell you this morning, I'm not trying to chase you off. All right, you are welcome here anytime you want to be here. You do not have to talk like everyone else or, or dress like everybody else or anything like that. If you are interested in what we have to offer, if you are interested in the truth that you hear, stick around. We would love to have you here. Uh, but Easter is a unique Sunday in the church because we often do have people who are coming from different fellowships or different places. Uh, attendance is often much higher than usual, uh, but... But what we need to understand, so I apologize, uh, which I'm going to do my best not to apologize too much. Uh, someone called me out for that last week, and I do it way too much. But I apologize if I try to take things too simply. One of the things that I realized in my upbringing was so much of church, so many people have been living for Jesus so long that they just expect everyone else to already know so much of this stuff. So we expect people to already know what the gospel is really all about. So what I would like to do this morning is just what Paul did here in 1 Corinthians 15. He said this in verse 1. He said, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I'd like to remind you, church, what Christianity is really all about. You know, Easter is a unique holiday. We, we get together for Good Friday, and we remember the death of Jesus, and then we come together Sunday, and we celebrate his resurrection. But I think for some of us, it has become so routine. It's become just, just something we do. And we lose track of the sight that what the gospel is really about is that Jesus conquered death. That a man who went and died on the cross was then able to get back up a few days later. This is an amazing miracle. And it happened 2,000 years ago, and so we can sort of become numb to the meaning of it. So I want to remind you this morning what this faith is really all about. I have a couple of small analogies I want to use to help with that. The first one, my car had been having alignment issues recently. 
Uh, as I'm sure most of you understand, if your car alignment is off, you can still get from point A to point B, but it just takes a little bit more effort. It takes a little bit more attention. If your car's alignment is off and you don't put in that effort or attention, if you are lucky, you will end up in a ditch. If you are unlucky, you will end up in oncoming traffic. The same can happen for us in our faith. We can lose track of what it is that we're doing. We can just sort of, does anyone ever zone out when they drive? Oh, you guys are better drivers than I am. Sometimes I'm just, my, my head is off a thousand miles away and, and I get from point A to point B, but I can lose focus. Sometimes that can happen in the faith. You can start to drift. You can still make it through life, but things just take a little bit more effort, or perhaps if it gets worse and worse, they take a lot more effort. Rather than the things of the faith giving you joy and giving you encouragement, they can start to feel draining, can start to feel exhausting, it can start to feel like work. If church feels like work to you, unless you're a pastor, I guess, since this is work for me, if, if church, getting up to come to church feels like something straining for you to do, something that is stealing away your time or stealing away your joy, then something is severely wrong. Church should be something we come to and become filled with joy. Reading the Bible should not be something that, oh, I've got to do this. Oh, yeah, let me read this. Got to do my devotion. No, it should be something that you long for this and you say, oh, wow, that's so amazing where God is revealing things to you that are applying directly to your life. If Christianity is feeling like hard work, we need to watch ourselves because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, the Christian walk isn't always easy, but what you'll find is if you're doing something that you love, hard work starts to seem easy. Okay? What we need to find is if we get our alignment back on track, Christianity should be something that fills you with joy unspeakable and full of glory. It should be something that gives you peace that passes understanding. And so my goal for you, if you are a believer in Christ and the faith has become something draining rather than something fulfilling, my goal for this morning is to help fix your alignment, to make sure that our spiritual alignment is exactly where it needs to be. Now, if you're not a Christian this morning and you're in this place, there's no alignment to fix yet. We've got to buy you a whole new vehicle. But we'll seek to do that as well. Let's go back to that first verse for a second here. Paul said, now I would remind you, brothers, he wasn't giving them new information. Nothing that I'm going to say to you this morning is new. This has been true from eternity past, and it will continue to be true until Jesus comes back, and even then after that. This is not new information. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. The gospel has been preached to you in all likelihood. If you were raised in the United States of America, uh, the gospel has probably been preached to you at some point in your life. And if it has not, I will endeavor to remedy that issue and make sure the gospel is preached to you today. But if you are a believer in Jesus and you have received the gospel, and now you are standing in that gospel. But notice there are two different aspects just listed there. He said, which you received. Now, uh, are there any English teachers in the crowd today? No? Okay. Received, what tense is that? Past tense. Oh, thanks. Thanks for raising your hand, man. You're a good student, aren't you? All right. That's past tense. Which you received means it's something that already happened. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have received the gospel. But it's not just something that happened in the past. He also says, in which you stand. Not in which you have stood or will stand, but right now. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the salvation we have received, is not just something we have received in the past. It is something that is affecting us right here and right now. Like I said, if your faith has become something that is draining on you, there's an issue because there's something keeping you from effectively standing in that faith. Verse 2, and by which you are being saved. 
are being saved. That's an interesting tense, too. Anybody know what that one is? It's not future. Don't want to trick you. It's present and active. Have you been saved? Yes, you have been saved. Will you be saved? Yes, you will be saved when Jesus comes back. But right now, you are being saved. Salvation is eternal. All right? We usually think of eternal as future, but eternal means past, present, and future. It means it has no beginning and no end. You received that salvation at the moment of faith, but did you know that salvation did not just apply to that moment and the future? It also applied to your past. When you receive faith in Jesus, he does not just pay for your sins. He also starts to redeem your past. God has used my sinful past for his glory because he has given me eternal life. He has redeemed the things that I used to do wrong and used even those in my favor. He is going to come back one day, which we'll get to that more as we continue. But Jesus will indeed come back one day, probably not super far in the future. And he will save us from this corrupt and dying world that we're in. But right now, he is saving us from the power of sin. And sin indeed has power. In fact, it's the controlling force in the life of the unbeliever. But church, if you are in the faith, if you are in Christ, you are being saved. He is delivering you actively, delivering you from that power of sin. And notice the, the latter part of that verse, which we didn't read yet, said, If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. That word if is incredibly important. We are being saved if we hold fast to the word that was preached. If we hold fast to the gospel. What can happen and what can make your alignment get out of whack is when you stop holding fast to the gospel and start turning to other things. Does that change the fact that you have been saved? No, but it changes that work of being saved in the present and active day. What we would call sanctification, which is a big church word for being made holy. If something is happening to where your behavior is becoming more wicked and more sinful, and yet you proclaim to be a Christian... Paul is basically exhibiting here that there is a serious problem. He said, by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Church, one of the greatest issues is that we have people who proclaim to be Christians who live exactly like the rest of the world or even worse than the rest of the world in their sin. Paul considers that to be a vain faith. There is a type of faith that is vain that we can say, yeah, I'm a Christian. In fact, in our country, it's not as common now, but if you would go back 20 or 30 years even, people would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Of course I'm a Christian. Isn't everybody? Because we were a Christian nation. But the thing is, there is a type of Christianity, nominal Christianity, where you're a Christian by name, but your life looks nothing like the life of Christ. That's not okay. That's a vain faith. You know, there was a time that actually Kelsey and I, we went to get her alignment fixed on her car, and uh, we tried to get the tires rotated, actually, is what it really was, and the same tire that was running low on air before started running low on air again, and we thought, wait, these tires are supposed to be rotated. That one should have been somewhere else now. So we got charged for our tires being rotated, but they didn't actually do the work. That can happen in Christianity at times. Unfortunately, sometimes we have reduced this whole Christian experience down to, oh, hey, you come up and said a prayer at the altar one time when you were seven or eight years old. Oh, you're good. Don't worry about anything. That's a vain type of salvation. Salvation should impact every single aspect of your life, and it should really impact every day of your life. You don't want to be sold some false materials. You don't want to be sold a bad bill of goods. That's a vain faith. Let's continue on a little bit with the car, getting back to that analogy. Your alignment is fixed when you can coast in a straight line. When you do not have to actively hold the steering wheel and your car continues to go straight. 
You know, I find at times in my life that I can drift one way or the other. Okay, and I, I'm a preacher. This is what I do for a living. And I find at times in my life I am still drifting where I can find that if I'm not super focused, because, guys, you can't be super focused 24-7. That's, you know, that's not part of the human experience. There are times that I find when I am not focused, when I'm just relaxed, that all of a sudden my behavior will start to drift. Or I can become lazy or I can become rude to my spouse. That's not okay. But my behavior, if my alignment with God is right, then I'll be serving him without even having to try really hard to serve him. In fact, most ministry, which by the way, God has called each and every one of you to be ministers. I'm going to keep saying that over and over again. Ministry should feel as natural as breathing. There are parts of ministry that are hard work, but the actual ministry process, it's natural. Honestly, I, I can't say I don't get stage fright. I can't say I don't get intimidated. But when I'm up here preaching the word to you guys, I don't get too scared. I might not make a ton of eye contact with you, but honestly, it feels as natural to me as breathing by the time I get here. It doesn't feel like hard work. I'd do it for free if I could pay my bills some other way, I promise. All right? But there's another example along with a car of alignment. And this one's been a common one that I've had to use in my sports past. And that's chiropractic medicine. When I first went to the chiropractor, my most recent time, see, I went to a chiropractor when I was in high school. And uh, I had some lower back issues. And he would, you know, adjust me, send me on my way, and then a couple days later, my back would be out again. He was fixing my symptoms, and I believe I preached, I've mentioned this before in a sermon, but I never actually solved my problem. Recently, when I went to the chiropractor, before they would do any work on my back, they took some x-rays. And then not only did they take the x-rays, they showed me the x-rays of my spine, and then they showed me the x-rays of what my spine should look like if it's healthy. They wanted to, they wanted me to see the beginning of the road, and they wanted me to see the end of the road so that I would be willing to pay the cost, both physically and financially, to get from point A to point B. So since our goal this morning is to make sure that our spiritual alignment is on track, let's follow a similar process. Let's review where our faith began. We're going to look at the, the simple points of the gospel. Let's review where the faith is headed, and then let's figure out what it's going to take, what the cost is going to be to get from point A to point B. Verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15. You can turn there if you'd like. We're going to flip to a few other places, but for the most part, we'll be in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. We came together as a church Friday night to remember the fact that, that Christ died died for our sins. He came to earth physically, he lived a perfect and sinless life, and then he died physically, though he did not deserve to die. We looked at this, we looked at detail after detail in the account of his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion, that he was unjustly punished for crimes which he did not commit. But there is a reason that he did that. If you compare this to our former estate, you'll understand why Christ died. Or if you're not in Christ, we'll compare this to your current estate. Romans 6 says this, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. Before Christ, I was free from doing the right thing. I was compelled to do the wrong thing. In fact, even when I wanted to do the right thing, the wrong thing kept coming out of me. What a wretched man I am who will save me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Before Christ, no matter how hard I would try to be good, bad still came out. But what fruit were you getting at the time, at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Evil kept coming out of me. My behavior was shameful, my attitude was shameful, and I was on a road leading to death. You know, I'm going to mention this here again in just a short while, but death is not actually a one-time event. 
When we speak of death, we speak about the very end of someone's life. But death is actually a pattern of life oftentimes. You know, let's leave that there. We're going to come back to that. Verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Before Christ, each and every one of us was on a road that was leading to death. No matter how hard you tried, no matter what you did, your direction was towards death. But now, because of Christ, we've been set free from sin. Look at the fruit. Church, this is what we are to be judged by. This is what we are to be known by, is by the fruit that comes out of us. One of the reasons that Christianity has lost its impact in our country is because our Christians have not been acting enough like Christ. But why is that happening? Where's our focus been, church? That's the issue. This is the issue, because I was raised in church. I just met with my former youth pastor from when I was a middle schooler, just a week ago, and we talked about some things, and one of the things that I lament the most, because he mentioned how responsive I was, how much I wanted to be involved in everything that was going on. I went to every church activity. I was as good of a church kid as I could be, and yet evil kept coming out of me because so much of church was focused on entertainment. Right? Here's the deal. If you wanted to go see a big, spectacular show, you would have had a lot of churches to choose from this Easter Sunday. I've seen some of the Easter productions that get put on, and they're they're magnificent. They're beautiful. I mean, they'll have light shows. They'll have entire plays and dramas and all of that stuff. When I came down to plan Easter service, I didn't plan a lot of that. That stuff's cool. That stuff's really fun to watch, but... Without the substance, the style doesn't do anything for me anymore. I've seen all the style. I've seen all the show. I've been to big Christian rock concerts and seen how exciting that is. But that didn't affect my life on a day-to-day basis. I'd have a great experience, but then I'd come home and live exactly how I had before. What I want you to hear this morning is the substance of the Christian faith that will indeed change your life. That previous verse, the end of those things is death. The way that each of us used to live was just breathing to death. We were doing things that were leading us straight towards death. You know, I have a statistic, and I might mention this one again, because I don't see it in my notes right here, so it must be later, but I really want to tell you this right now, so I'm going to. Uh, I, I saw a statistic a few years ago that says each slice of bacon that you eat takes nine minutes off of your life. But that can't be true, because if it were, I think I would have died before I was ever born. (laughs) But what you can understand from that is there are certain patterns of behavior that you can participate in that will shorten your expected lifespan. Death is not just a singular activity. It is a pattern of activities that has an end result. But life is not just something you live until you die. Eternal life is something that goes on forever and ever and ever. The free gift is given to us, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift is given to us because Jesus was willing to die to pay for it. Our sin was deserving of death. Jesus had not sinned and was therefore not deserving of death. And yet he died. So if he didn't deserve death and he paid death anyways, he has a credit he can give. He paid the debt of death that each and every one of us owed. You know, just as, because, you know, I I can hear your thoughts. Maybe not. Not really. Don't want to scare anybody. But when I think through some of this stuff, you could say, well, okay, well, that would just pay for the debt of one person. But we're going to look at some other passages that are going to talk about that. But sin came in by one man. Therefore, grace only had to come in by one man. Sin entered into all of creation by the acts of Adam. And therefore, the act of Christ and dying when he didn't deserve to die gave the free gift For all who would believe. He is the figurehead of the human race in that sense. But we'll we'll come back to that as well. 
He paid the debt of death that we owe. But that's a bold statement that some people will not accept. Because it seems too good to be true, which is something we talked about this morning. In fact, so many people, where your alignment will get off in your Christian walk is you will think that you have to do something else to try to pay him back. You'll think it's too good to be true that he would just pay for your sins and you don't have to do anything to fix it yourself. But that is the simplicity of grace. And when you try to do it yourself, you will just find yourself getting back off track. When we got my alignment fixed on my car, I went to a professional to do that. If I tried to fix my own alignment, I don't think my car would make it here. All right? I could not do that. I was not qualified. I was not equipped. But we go to the professional, not me, but Jesus Christ, and he is qualified and equipped to give us salvation. You're not good enough to figure it out on your own. You need Jesus to give it to you. But some people won't accept it because it seems too good to be true. 1 Corinthians, back to 15. The truth continues, says that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Because he did not deserve death, because he was free and innocent of any charge of sin, he rose from the dead. Once again, you want to hear something that sounds good, too good to be true? Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He paid the debt of death that he did not owe. And in a sense, he was therefore refunded his life. Because he didn't deserve death, because he was righteous, he came back to life. It seems too good to be true, but I promise you that it is true. And you don't just have to take my word for that. Look at the eyewitnesses' accounts. Verse 5. After he was raised from the dead, it says, And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. He appeared to his closest friends and apostles. Okay, well that's something, but it goes beyond that. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still asleep, or still alive, though some have fallen asleep. He didn't just appear to his closest friends. He appeared to a group of over 500 people after he had died, most of whom were still alive when Paul was writing this. That's why Paul said most of whom are alive, basically saying you can go ask them for yourselves. We have an issue 2,000 years later. Okay, We are taught, our modern worldview teaches us that people 2,000 years ago were primitives. Oh, maybe they just couldn't, maybe they were easier to trick than us. Guys, the worldview you're being sold by a lot of uh, the media is just wrong. The theory of evolution that's being taught in schools, and, and really, not just in schools, but it pervades so much of our museums and everything, that's based on so many presuppositions that can't be proven. Okay? I don't want to go into a ton of detail, but I guess i got an extra hour or so. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the thing is, it's based on presuppositions. It's based on things that can't be proven. Here's why. In science, each of you, if you were taken to a science class, and you were to perform an experiment, you had two types of variables. You had your independent variable and your dependent variable. The goal was you wanted to get one thing so isolated by itself so that you could actually determine if that thing was causing what your hypothesis said it was causing. But what has happened is, in the realm of historical science, you look at things that are buried in the ground, these fossils, and they say, ah, oh, this must have, you know, it happened 50 to 60 million years ago. Where do they get that number from? Anybody know? I know a few places where they'll say they get that number from. But usually what they'll do is based on what layer of the rocks it's found in. That's how many years old it is. Okay. How do they know the rocks are that old? Believe it or not, they know the rocks are that age because of the fossils they find within it. Anybody see that? The circle, all right? And, and people will say there are things like carbon dating and, and uh, other types of dating ways. Once again, we're talking about something that you're saying is 50 million years ago old that you're trying to assume how much of this substance was there before and is there now, okay? Guys, we have cats at our house. If we drop something on the ground, that thing is not going to stay on the ground if the cats decide they want to move it. All right? To imagine that this thing just sat there and rested there for millions and millions of years without being at all disturbed, that takes a pretty big leap of faith. I'm not saying that it can't be true, but I'm saying those statements are not based on scientific observation. They're based on assumptions. They begin with the assumption that the theory of evolution is true and all this stuff is true, and therefore, 
Because here's, here's the last thing I'll say on that, because this is not the overall topic. But what I'm telling you is that people tell you that science is the chief, uh, the chief thing. You know, that's the standard for by which everything else is measured. Be willing to question the scientists as much as scientists are willing to quest, question the preachers. All right, they have a lot of questions that they have to answer on some of this kind of stuff. Because here's the deal. If we say that something is 50 million to 60 million years old, that is not a very precise guess, is it? You could be 10 million years off, right? Go up to any, any lady, um, keep a safe distance, and try to guess her age and be 10 million years off and see how that goes for you, <laughs> right? It's just not a very precise thing. So all I'm saying for you, you don't have to just, to, based on, you know, a, a three-minute excerpt from a sermon, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking that I'm going to convince anybody who believes in evolution that that's kind of, I'm not foolish enough to think that. But all I'm telling you is, don't just accept something just because a science teacher tells you that either. Okay, do your homework, do your best on your homework, and get all the questions right that you can. But, but I'm just saying, those things are able to be questioned as well. In fact, all of scientific inquiry is about questioning things. Be willing to question the world that you're sold. Because there is an agenda out there in science and politics and everything that there is something that that the world is trying to get across that is contrary to what God is trying to get across. And you have to decide who is more reliable. Personally, I would take the words of a man who lived a perfectly sinless life. Here's how sinless his life was. His enemies couldn't even find anything to stick to him. Let me ask you, any politician, any politician, if you wanted to find something wrong with them, how much digging do you think you'd have to do? Probably not much. You see it come out all the time. You know, there's always scandal after scandal, and these people are supposed to be our leaders. Really, any preacher, if you wanted to find something wrong in my life, you would not have to dig that hard. But in Jesus' life, the only accusation that the Pharisees, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, could bring against him was that he claimed to be the Son of God. That's the only unrighteousness they could even try to charge him with. Even historically, 2,000 years later, there have been relatively no substantive actually there have been no substantive efforts to actually well there have been efforts sorry there's been no substantive accusation that could be brought against jesus in fact even most of the world religions say that jesus of nazareth was a very great man in my opinion he is the most reliable source of information about whatever it is he wants to talk about if the events in the scripture are true which i believe them to be true so it's choose who you want to trust I have chosen to trust him, and there are going to be certain results that come out of my life as a result of that. Ideas have consequences. And what Paul is trying to communicate is, you don't just have to take Paul's word for it. You could go and ask 500 different people who saw him in the flesh after he was dead. He died and he rose again, and it was witnessed by more than 500 people. And not just them, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. The James mentioned there, there were, uh, there was, uh, there were apostles named James, but also his half-brother was named James. We don't know which one. But he appeared again to the 12 apostles, or the 11 apostles. And last of all, he appeared to one, as to one untimely born. He appeared also to me. Then he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul was not someone who would have been easily swayed about anything, if you know anything about Paul. He was not an easily swayed man. He was highly educated. He was religiously zealous against Christianity. He thought it was as false as it could be, and there was nothing that would have changed his mind except Jesus himself literally met him on the road, struck him with blindness, and, and basically made him go to a Christian to get deliverance from his blindness. Paul was not someone who would be easily tricked. And he was persuaded to the point that he was willing to die for that faith. The entirety of the Christian faith hinges on the fact that Christ rose from the dead. This is what we come here on Easter to celebrate and to remember. Verse 14 of this same chapter. Perhaps I didn't put that one in here. But... I'll quote it for you. It says, if Christ did not rise, then our preaching is vain and your faith is worthless. The first song we sang this morning, He Lives. It's a beautiful song. I serve a risen Savior. Wait, way too high on that. But it's a beautiful song. But the story about that song is actually very interesting. 
The man who wrote the song was a preacher, from my understanding, and he had heard on the radio on an Easter Sunday, people were basically saying, ah, it doesn't really matter if, if Jesus actually rose or not, because it's a good story, and you know what, the details aren't actually all that important. And he was so offended by that, he was so frustrated, because the scripture literally says how important the resurrection is. So he wrote this song, I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today, I know that he's living, no matter what men say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his loving, okay, I, I'm going to hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart, and here's the key to it. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. If people can't see Jesus through you, who are they going to see it through? If people can't see the gospel by seeing your life, if they can't see evidence of that, they're going to look for other ideas. Mahatma Gandhi even said, I love your Christ, but I hate your Christians. If your Christians acted more like your Christ, all of India would be saved. Now, in one way, that's a vain excuse, but in another way, it makes some sense. The more the church starts acting like the church, the less we'll have to worry about the world around us. Because they'll see our good works and they'll glorify our Father who's in heaven. Let's get back to this. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That phrase, first fruits, is important. The first fruits of a harvest in, in Jewish culture were offered as a sacrifice to God. They take the first part of each of their harvests and offer it as a first fruit to God. The idea was that by offering the first fruits, that the rest of the batch would be made holy. So if Christ is our first fruits and we are the rest of the batch, if he is holy and raised from the dead, we too will be holy and will one day rise from the dead. Here's the verse that I mentioned earlier. It says, For as by a man came death, by a man has all come also the resurrection of the dead. The curse of death has been on humanity since the days of of Adam. Every single human being, save for Enoch and Elijah, has died due to the decision made by Adam and Eve back in the garden. Death has reigned ever since. As it continues, it says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam set the course of human uh, history that followed him on a course to death. But Christ, when he came to this earth some 2,000 years ago, changed the direction that humanity was heading. But not all of humanity. All shall be made alive, but not all will be made alive for heaven. Unfortunately, church, hell is a real place. It is a place where people go to be punished for continuing in this life of sin, for rejecting the gospel as it is offered. Death is, once again, not a one-time event. Death is something that each of us lived in. When you see, you can, death has a smell to it. Did you know that? You can smell death. You ever heard that phrase, someone smells like death? They smell like death. You can see this in the lives of some people, that their lives are so far gone as far as decisions that they've made, be it drugs or alcohol or, or any other number of things that we would consider to be socially acceptable, where they have become a shell of a human being. They have become a living corpse. Death is often a series of decisions. This is where I had my you know, bacon line in there, but I wanted to share that with you earlier. All right? Many of our lives are shortened by decisions that we make, but unfortunately, many of our lives are shortened by decisions that others make. Death is the giant elephant of a problem that is in every room that we mourn, but that up until Jesus had no solution. But Jesus showed us for the first time that death can be defeated. Death is not the end. Death is terrifying to this world, but in Christ, death is not your end. It's just a step. You take one step on earth, and then your next step is in eternity with God. What does death actually mean? It means separation. 
Death is not just a one-time thing. Death is separation. You know, uh, for me, when I was in college, I wasn't into drugs and alcohol. I was just into serious video game abuse. Okay, now, and I know a lot of people play video games, and I've talked about this before, but what I'm talking about is staying up till 4 a.m., 5 a.m., sleeping through college. In fact, one night, I stayed up 24 hours, and I didn't realize I had to work the next day. And so I got a phone call at 5 p.m. I was about to go and sleep. I had been up for well over 24 hours at that point. And they called and said, where are you at? You're on the schedule today. And so I had to drive into my job, and I remember drifting off, trying, not trying, but trying to avoid falling asleep on the drive there and the drive home. I had made decisions of death. I was a danger to myself, and I was a danger to everybody else because of the decisions that I was making. I was becoming a shell of a human being. I was becoming so disassociated with my real life because I was so focused on a virtual life. This was a pattern of decisions that I was making that would have led to my harm and the harm of many others. But thanks be to God, Jesus Christ came in when I was at my weakest and brought me back to life. We'll talk about that more here very shortly. But here's the thing. The end of our faith is this. Death will be defeated once and for all, forever and ever and ever. Life will reign from eternity to eternity forever, evermore. That's the end of our faith. Verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. This is the thing that we as a church are looking forward to. Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he comes back, we will all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will put down this body of death, and we will take on an eternal body, a glorified body, that does not feel sickness, nor pain, or any of that. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Jesus Christ coming to earth was all about the mission to destroy death once and for all. The entire story of salvation, the story of Jesus, boils down to God's destruction of death. People ask all the time, if there is truly a good God, if there is a good and loving God, then why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer is, he's working on it. But if he came back too soon, there are people who we might consider to be good people that would deserve hell by their own decisions. They are walking in sin, and God does not want to, to waste the life of a single person. He wants, his patience means salvation. He wants to completely destroy death. He doesn't like it when bad things happen to good people. He wants to destroy all those bad things. He wants to completely get rid of bad things, but to do that, he has to get rid of sin. And if there are people still living under sin, he's getting rid of them too. So he wants to give them time that they don't have to die as sinners, but that they can be redeemed and have this life as well. So God allows bad things to happen to good people so that bad people can be saved. That's why he allows that to happen. Because he's patient. He's far more patient than any of us are. In one sense, this story began at Calvary. Really, this story began all the way at creation. Back in Genesis, as soon as they sinned, God prophesied about how he was going to fix it. The serpent, to the serpent, he said, you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. On the cross, Satan struck Jesus' heel, so to speak. The enemy thought he had gotten the victory. We killed the sun, we killed the air, we did it. But by his resurrection, he showed, nope. He is truly the victor. He is greater than death. He is greater than any enemy. As I said, death is not something that just happens at the end of your life. Here's another verse on that. The book of Ephesians says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Now, once again, tense, you were dead. That's past tense, right? He's not writing this book to people who are physically dead, all right? Death is not just what happens at the end of life. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, 
following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Back in the day, we were dead and we were just living according to whatever our sinful nature would tell us. It says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Church, if you are a Christian, you were once a dead person walking. If you are here this morning and you're not a Christian, you still are a dead person walking. All you're doing is just living until the end. And the nature in which you live is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. We make terrible decisions for ourselves. I mentioned my decisions with video games. This doesn't necessarily immediately cease in some ways when you get saved. For example, yesterday I ate far more uh, meat than I probably should have in a given day. I had a delicious barbecue pulled pork sandwich. I had a couple of servings of wings. I had a pizza, an entire pizza. It was a smaller pizza, but okay. I ate way too much. I was making poor decisions of death because in that sense, in a smaller sense, I was being carried along by the desires of my body. I was ordering with my eyes and eating with my eyes instead of with my stomach. It looked like it tastes what? <laughs> eating for two. Yeah, I don't get that excuse. Kelsey gets that excuse. I don't. I was eating way too much. And I suffered last night because of it. I did not sleep so well. But that's okay. God even used that for my good. Okay, and I, that's another story for another day. You can ask me about that after service, how that worked. It's pretty cool. But uh, I won't take any more of your time with that. But if you are not a Christian, if you are not saved by the blood of Jesus, you are living according to death. You are living according to your passions and pleasures. And the only decision you have as a sinner under the control of the sinful nature is to trade one sin for another. For example, I'm sure you've seen examples of people who have struggled with obesity. They have taken terrible care of their bodies and they have become a gluttonous. They eat however much they want of whatever they want. And as a result, their body ends up in terrible shape. And then they all of a sudden make a change and they lose a ton of weight and they get in great shape. And you think, oh, good for them. But then what often happens is they become haughty. They become high-minded. They become prideful. I was a nerdy kid growing up. Right? I was a very nerdy kid. I'm a very nerdy adult. But then I started to get good at basketball in high school. And all of a sudden, my attitude started changing. I started walking around differently. I traded one uh, social awkwardness for a different social awkwardness. Okay, that's a small example, but with sin, it's the same way. You can trade one sin for another. Because what I've seen happen in multiple marriages even is where one of the spouses all of a sudden goes on a fitness kick. They get in great shape, and then they all of a sudden leave their spouse. They get more attention from someone at the gym. They say, ooh, I want to see what they have to offer. They trade the sin of gluttony for the sin of adultery. And that's how the sinful nature works. And it pervades the lives, it controls the lives of each and every unbeliever. But the greatest phrase in this entire book is right here, but God. It's one of the most beautiful phrases in the entire Bible. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. While we were dead, did Jesus come to you when you were you know, at your best and brightest, when you were just at the peak of everything and you were just so happy and everything was great? For me, he came to me when I was at my lowest. When, like I said, I was staying up all night playing video games. I was risking my life and the lives of others getting on the road. I was making terrible decisions all the time. God came to me when I was at my least valuable to the world. I mentioned this before, but with professional athletes, you know, there's a guy who owns a ranch down the road. His name's Adam Vinatieri. You ever heard of that name? This guy is a legendary field goal kicker. Absolutely amazing. Won multiple Super Bowls, but he's getting up there. He's, he's you know, in his 40s, and football careers typically don't last that long. How long? Well, I know 40s isn't getting up there, but for a football <laughs> player, that's getting up there. Okay. For a football player, that's getting up there. Most running backs barely make it to 30, all right, for their playing career. But anywho, how long is it going to be before his name's not even really remembered? He was once so valued by the franchises, and he'll be a legend, and there will be people who know his name the rest of his life. You might even be able to see him in the Hammond's Prairie Store every now and then, just to let you know. 
But what I'm getting at is once you lose value in sports, most people just forget you. Once you lose value at your work or whatever it might be, most people just want to move on. But God will continue to find you valuable when everyone else is ready to give up on you. That's what I want you to understand there. While we were dead, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. If he is your savior, you have been saved by grace. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus' resurrection points to our resurrection. He is seated in heaven, he seated us in heavenly places, which means he gave us a position of honor. You know, if you're talking about sitting around a table and they would give the, the high seats of honor, being seated in that sense. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Our lives now and in the future are meant to be an example of his grace and his kindness towards us. I cannot express to you strongly enough how true this has proven to be in my life. I cannot tell you how many times in Christ, in my life, that I have been overwhelmed or distraught. I had a problem that was bigger than I could solve. I did not know what to do. I've had multiple times of difficulties like that. In fact, many of the past few weeks have seemed this way. As we've, I've mentioned plenty of times, Kelsey and I are going to have a baby sometime soon. And that's an exciting, wonderful thing. But it's also a terrifying thing. They make you come home with those things after you give birth to them. You're supposed to just know how to raise them. I, I've been telling people, I haven't been that busy recently, but I've been overwhelmed like I'm busy because I can see this giant task that is ahead of me. Likewise, we were planning for Easter service. That's a giant task. We had a lot going on. There are a lot of things going on there. I can become overwhelmed, and yet, in the midst of all of it, I've developed a peace that passes understanding. That I trust God to figure it out. For example, this, is, this one's kind of funny. Friday night, we had our Good Friday service, okay? Now, I don't ask Kelsey for too much feedback on my sermons, usually. Um, I don't want to scare her too bad, but sometimes I like to scare her with this one. I'll tell her how many slides I have. If you want to know, there are 33 slides in today's, and we're probably at about 18 or 19. Just to let you know. But don't worry, it's not even 11 yet, so we've got at least another hour. You're good. <laughs> kidding, kidding. I know it's warm in here, all right? My slides for Friday night, there were 74 slides. <laughs> but I told her, I said, don't worry, honey, I'm not going to preach on it. For the most part, we're going to read it. I'm going to make very limited commentary. And, and she said, I don't know, honey, that's a lot to try to get through. And she's right, it was a lot to try to get through. And I, you know, trusted God and said, you know, that I can't see any part of this that I can take out. I think God wants the whole thing to come out here, so I'm going to do it. So we got through service, and I pulled out my phone and looked at the clock, and it was like 7.28. We got through it all in an hour. And I went up to Kelsey, and I invented a new dance. It was called my Told You So dance, and I'm not going to do that for you now. But I was so excited because she's had a lot of I Told You So moments. As far as you guys know, I preach very long at times. No one shouted amen. Thank you. All right. I preached for a long time at times, but, but I was thankful because I trusted. I was like, God, you're going to take care of it. And if I go too long, you're going to give the people patience that they're going to be willing to sit here and wait. All right. So I've developed this patience and this peace to where I trust God and say, you know what? I do not understand this problem, but I've seen how faithful you've been in every other problem that I've had. So I'm just going to trust you. I'm still scared. I'm still overwhelmed. But I know that you're going to give me exactly what I need. And being a parent, I'm terrified, I'm overwhelmed, but I know that God is going to give me exactly what I need every step of the way to be the kind of father he wants me to be. I am not my own workmanship anymore. In fact, that's going to be communicated here in a couple verses. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. If you're an unbeliever and you're here this morning, understand this. So many people think they have to clean up their lives before God will want anything to do with them. No, that is 100% false. If you could clean up your own life, you wouldn't need God. 
God will clean up your life because salvation is a gift from him. You don't earn a gift. It's freely given to you. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. God doesn't want you to trade one type of sin for another. He doesn't want you to, you know, just try to go out and make a million dollars selling a best-selling book of how I got fit or how I did this or that. No, if he changes your life, he wants to be the one who gets the credit because then he's going to use you to change other people's lives. Because what happens? You see the dieting commercials. Sorry I'm making this so much about food. It's because we had that amazing breakfast, and I think I need to skip lunch, all right? You see the commercials where they have the testimonials. Oh, this program did this for me, and it'll work for you too. That's how Christianity is spread. When someone says, what happened to you? You used to be be this way and this way, and now all of a sudden you're this way and this way. And you can't say, oh, I followed a 12-step program. No, God changed me. Oh, that's too simple. You're right, it is. It was way too simple. I didn't deserve it. It was way easier than I expected it to be. It's been hard, but he's done all of the heavy lifting. It's not a result of my works. He did it so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. This is an amazing phrase. I have to pause before we even read the rest. We are his workmanship. Did you know if you are a Christian, you are God's workmanship? You know what that means? It's his job to fix you up. So why are you trying to do it yourself? This is interesting. This is actually very helpful. We are His workmanship, that means if you create a problem for yourself, you have the access and the need, actually, to go to him and say, God, I messed up. He'll say, yeah, you did. But he never comes down on me hard and says, oh, and you're going to be punished and suffer for this. No, he's always there to fix it because I am his workmanship. When I was a basketball coach, if a player came up to me and said, coach, I really messed up in this or that, if they're acknowledging their guilt, I'm never going to try to harp on them. I'm all, I'm there to help any way I can. But if they're like, no, I didn't mess up. I did this right. That's when you get after them. That's when, okay, we can think about how right you are while you run these sprints. Okay? That's when discipline is necessary. Discipline is necessary often to correct an attitude problem. If the attitude is right, really easy to coach kids. Amen? My coaches out there, if they have the right attitude, they're really easy to coach. Amen? Awesome. Right? If they have the wrong attitude, they're very hard to coach. If you have the right attitude with God, if you understand that you are his workmanship and that you are his responsibility in that sense, and you go to him and say, God, I can't fix this one. Good. Your attitude is right. He can. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here's the simple imagery that this is trying to present. The good works that you do, this is why I said it feels naturally like, it feels like breathing to do much of the ministry work that God gives you to do. God has already prepared the work beforehand. All you have to do is walk in it. He does all of the heavy lifting. He does all of the difficult stuff where you just be obedient to him, and he takes care of everything else. Another thing about Friday night, I realized one of my own logistical issues. Okay, you guys are getting the weak side of being a pastor, just so you know. Friday night, I realized we had two special scheduled, but I didn't communicate with the two specials to make sure they weren't singing the same song. And so I didn't realize that until uh, Becky came up to sing the special. And so then for about 15 to 30 seconds, I had this dread come over me. Oh no, I didn't cross off a logistical box. I could have created a big problem for myself here. And then I heard her start singing, and she has such a beautiful voice. And you'll get to hear her sing at the end of this service too. But then I had this peace come over me. Oh, good. Something that I forgot to do did not come back to bite me. Thank you, God. I trust you. He fills in for my weaknesses on a daily, hourly, and minute-by-minute basis, and I am so thankful for that. I am here today not because of my intelligence or my ability, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he's done. He prepares the works beforehand. I just walk in them. It's amazing how everything that ends up coming up, when people ask me a question or something like that, God has already prepared me for it. But all I have to do is walk through it. He does the same for each and every one of us. Here's a verse that I'm sure you're familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago to show us that death can be defeated. He is coming back once again to deliver the final blow to death once and for all. 
But today, here and now, he will defeat death in your life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. God does not want you to die. Now, physically we might die, but, but that is so small compared to what God is talking about. Because the dead who die in Christ live forever. They're in better shape than any of us. Every funeral that I've been to through this church, you know, we mourn because we're sad. We're going to miss people. But we never mourn the person. We never mourn for the person. The people who have died from this church in this past year, that we know where they're at. We know that they are in glory and they are happier now than they probably ever could have been on earth. We mourn for ourselves, but we rejoice for them because they have eternal life. If you are not a Christian this morning, Jesus Christ wants to destroy death and make you alive and set you on a new path. If you are a Christian this morning, Jesus Christ wants to make sure that that life is coming through you, that your alignment is exactly where it needs to be, and that what is supposed to be coming out of you is coming out of you, because you are his workmanship. He takes pride in you, because you're called by his name. God sent his son that we might live. What are you saved from? You're saved from sin, but sin leads to death. Sin is so often unseen, but we can see death. Sin is what's going on behind the scenes. Death is what comes out on the surface. So he makes it simple for us. Salvation is salvation from death. Salvation from the end of the road where we were headed. Salvation is life, eternal life. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, I want you to hear these last few verses very carefully. And this is the judgment. This is from the same chapter, a little bit further on. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Jesus was killed by wicked men to try and hide their wickedness. The beauty of the cross is that you don't have to hide your weakness anymore. You don't have to hide your flaws anymore. You can take it all to Jesus, and he will take it and wash it away. But the world wanted to hide its weakness. They didn't want to acknowledge their wickedness. They wanted to say, no, we're just fine without you. And they killed him as a result of it. And that is the judgment that the world is indeed sinful. Here's the greatest proof of sin. They killed Jesus, the most righteous humble and holy man to ever walk on the earth, they murdered him. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. You know, I, I'm sure most of you have heard about this by now, but someone came in and stole a part off of our church van. I guarantee you they didn't come in and do that in broad daylight. They came in by the cover of darkness because they didn't want anyone to see what they were doing. If, by the way, if whoever did it is in here, we forgive you, just so you know, because that's what Christ calls us to do. Don't do it again, please. But we forgive you. The grace of God is available for you. Just know that. All right? Things, things are all going to perish away anyways. Your soul is going to last forever. Okay? Turn from the darkness. Walk in the light, and you can live. People who are wicked, they do wicked things. They hate the light. They won't come to the light, lest their work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So many today reject Jesus because they don't want to leave their own wicked ways. Unfortunately, people love their sin until they face the consequences of it. People love doing wicked things until they're called to account. I have one more sports example for you. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard the name Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's a really famous basketball player, a very good basketball player. And actually, early in his career, uh, he professed to be a Christian. You know, there was some uh, media stuff about how he followed Christ. Well, this week, he, uh, some of his direct messages between him and this other guy, Michael Rappaport, I think is his name, got exposed. And the vulgarity, just the terrible language they were using towards each other, how hateful they were being was just the light was shown on it. Well, then, of course, Kevin was interviewed about that a little bit later in the week, and his attitude was all of a sudden very different than it was in the text messages. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want people to see me in that light or think that way of me. He didn't want the light to be shown because things would be exposed. 
We have such an, an obsession at times in this world with an appearance of righteousness. But the thing is, God offers a true substance of righteousness. People love their wickedness. They just don't want to be called on their wickedness. But when you shine the light in, wickedness shows up and it's got to go away. When light shines in, what does darkness have to do? Leave. Darkness can't cast out light. Light casts out darkness. Understand, people will walk around in darkness their entire lives because they're afraid for things to be exposed. They'll have wounds that need to be healed, but they just hide them because, oh, I don't want to come into the light. I don't want people to see me for who I really am. But let me ask you this question. Do you shower in the dark? No, that would be silly, right? Do you, you know, ladies, do you do your makeup in the dark? Do you do your hair in the dark? Probably not unless you, you know, don't have any other options. Do you get dressed in the dark? No, typically, you do those things in the light because you want to do a good job of them. If you want to be clean, you can't be cleaned in the darkness. You need to come to the light that you may be clean. People avoid coming to the light because they're afraid of being exposed because they think that God is going to be mad at them. God hates sin. He absolutely hates sin. But what I have found time and time and time and time and time and time again over the past 11 years is that every single time I bring my sin, I bring my sorrow, I bring my shortcomings to the light, God always responds with mercy, and he always responds with grace. He is not here to try to hurt you and beat you down for everything you've done wrong. He is here to heal you and to help you. God desires salvation for all people, but if you hold yourself back from him, if you remain in darkness... You will die in darkness. You will walk in a pattern of death that has a very distinct end. But if you come to the light, he will give you love, kindness, and mercy. He will change your life. He will save you so that you are justified. You will have a hope in the future that he is coming back. But he will change your life in the right here and now. This has been the biggest focus uh, on my mind recently. The salvation in the here and now. If the church would start acting like Christ, what a difference we would see in this world. And I think we do see that. I don't want to guilt everyone. But what I'm getting at is the more we act like Christ, the more of an impact we will have on the society around us. Salvation has benefits for you each and every day. When you come to the light and you come to Christ, what happens is the light starts to then reflect off of you out into the rest of the world. Jesus said you are the salt and the light and the earth. And it's time that we start acting as such. The key for every one of us on doing that, believer and formerly unbeliever alike, is to come to the light. I'm going to pray here shortly. But I want you to know these altars are open during this time of prayer. These altars are open as we sing to prepare for communion. These altars will be open as you take communion. The thing is, if you have been walking in darkness, it's time to come to the light. Coming to the light is the only way that these problems ever get solved. These secret sins, these wounds that need to be healed, they are only resolved by coming to the light. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that the light has shone into the world. Of our own doing, we had only darkness. But in your mercy and in your kindness, you have sent your Son as the light to deliver us from sin. But dear God, our sins are scary. And just like in the middle of the night, if a bright light shines in, we're often intimidated by such a brightness coming into such a dark area. But dear God, I ask that you shine the light in all the more that it becomes inescapable, that the eyes of the world around us adjust to the light that they're seeing. Dear God, let us be those beacons of light in the world. Save us, O oh God. Deliver us. Continue to deliver us from our sinful habits, from our sinful thoughts, from all of our sins, O oh God, that people might see that we are indeed your workmanship, that they might see that we are the living embodiment of the resurrection of Jesus. If you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Dear God, I ask that you make that each and every one of our prayer. And that each and every one of us would exhibit that in the world. That they can see Jesus through us. 
For then so many of the problems we see in this world would start to be resolved. Dear God, let that work continue in us and continue in our hearts and branch out to those in our community. I ask in the great and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to be in your house of worship, Lord, freely and openly to declare you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, as we get ready to partake in uh, these emblems, Lord, 2,000 years ago, you sat down with your apostles, and Lord, you laid out for us the way to have the supper, Lord. And even after your resurrection, Lord, on the road where you met with your disciples and you broke bread with them afterwards and revealed yourself to them, Lord, we know that you have risen from the tomb, that you are the one true living God. Lord, as we get ready to partake in this bread that represents your body, Lord, may we remember the sacrifice that was given. Lord, for the love that you have for us who are so unworthy of it, but are saved through your grace and mercy, Lord. Lord, we just take a moment to thank you and to praise you for that, Lord. And Father God, as we continue to give you the praise and the glory for this wonderful life, for the grace that's been brought to mankind, for the partaking of these emblems, Heavenly Father, the fruit of the vine, the bread, Heavenly Father, may we all recognize that you in control of the affairs of all mankind, and as we give our life to you, Lord, we thank you. For it's through your Son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
know, they bound the hands of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon him and yelled, crucify him, crucify him. So innocent and pure he became, blameless. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe in the old rugged cross. I believe in a man called Jesus, because without him, we all would be lost. close up today uh, just a couple of brief announcements a reminder to our kids not to get out of here before you grab your goodie bags uh, to any visitors that we had this morning if you'd like for us to have your contact information and be able to reach out to you 
On the back of your bulletins, if you grabbed one of those, there's a place for that. There are also some little cards out in the foyer. Feel free to fill one of those out if you have any questions or anything like that and turn that into the offering box. Um, you know, I know I preached fairly long today, but, but understand this, that I've been told that I preach like I'm never going to get a chance to preach again. And I think that's true because there's a chance that I won't see some of you ever again. You know, there's a chance that something could happen to me or you could go somewhere else or who knows. So uh, take it to heart. I know it's, it can be hard to sit still and listen, but I appreciate your guys' kindness in that. Uh, with that being said, if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about something after service, please feel free. Uh, the altar call does not stop when service stops. It's still open if uh, anybody has anything they really need to get worked out there. So let me give you a quick reminder as you leave. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you're ever confused and don't know what to do, look at the Word of God and watch what happens. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you, dear God, one last time that you raised your son from the dead and that by his resurrection we have the promise of a, of a resurrection and eternal life as well. Dear God, please take us from this place in safety, but Lord, let us not leave your presence. Lord, let us remain in that presence all the day long and the rest of the days of our lives. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Have a blessed Sunday.